Our discussion this afternoon is a very crucial to everyone. Let us remember what Jesus says, follow me. Because he who follow me shall not walk in darkness, but have a light of life. John 8, verse 12. That is a present truth. We're going to dis- learn a lessons from the Old and New Testament formalism. I have entitled this topic, When Worship Becomes Worthless Before God. Sounds strange. But it happened. It occurred in the Old Testament and New Testament repeatedly. When worship becomes worthless before God, the practice of religious life through formalism is the grossest of all self-deception. What is worship? I don't need to define what is worship. Every one of us who are Christian, we understand. But how do we really understand that our worship is acceptable to God? Let me repeat what I have discussed in the previous episodes. The Bible definitions of truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is truth? Your word is truth. The entirety of your word is truth. Your words are truth. Your law is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is truth. And when we come to truth about God, worship is inevitable. Jesus examines religions of the heart. He procreates. Will did Isaiah prophecy about you? Saying, these people drew me near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching doctrines of the commandments of men. Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9. Let me repeat that. These people draw, come to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and their worship is in vain, because teaching the doctrines of the commandments of men. Jesus spoke this not to the outsiders. To the church, to his people, home everything, the ritual in the sanctuary in their life throughout the year. Jesus was the center. But when Jesus came, look what happened. If we try to look at the context and the background of this verse, Matthew 5, Jesus quoted this directly from Isaiah, Psalm 78. And numbers 13 and 14. This is the larger context of this text. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men, whose men, the people of God, hold departed from his commandment and his law. That is Isaiah 29, 13. They flattered him with their mouths. They lied him with their tongue. Psalm 78, 36. And also in the context of Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Did you remember number 14, 13? They are not really in good relationship with God. And so here we find our title. When worship becomes worthless, when it is lip service, when it is mouth service, when heart is not in there, 
Because that's what they believe. Hearing the right words but doing the wrong things. Please come. Hear what the Lord, word of the Lord, comes from the Lord. So they come to you as a people. Do. They sit before you as my people. They hear the words but they do not do them. With their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song, one who has a pleasant voice and can play well an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. Ezekiel 33, verses 30 to 32. Here is again, in the Old Testament, Live service, going to church. What are you going to do in church? We will unravel that by and by. Worthless worship is called formalism. What is formalism? Anything is formal. But what is formalism? It is easy to illustrate than that to defy the word. When a man is a Christian in name only and not in reality, in outward things only, not in the inward feelings, in profession only, not in practice, when his Christianity is short, is a mere matter of form or passion or custom, without any influence of his heart or life, such a case, this is the man has we call formal religion. He possesses indeed the form or a shell or surface of religion, but he does not possess its substance or its power, as Paul describes it, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Such turn away. Formalism. Formalism is the most self-deceiving Self-deception of any man who come to God. And the Bible is replete with such kind of religious experience. You might be born, live, grow in church, but not in Christ. Do not misunderstand me. You may have been born in the church, being raised in the church, educated in the church, served in the church. You could have married in the church, dead in the church, until it was veiled in the church and still ended in hell because perhaps you were only in church but not in Christ. That is formalism. They clearly profess to be Christians and yet is neither heart nor life in their Christianity. There is but one thing to be said about them. They are formal Christian. Their religion is only form. A form. This is cutting words. Because today in our world and our church, church members fulfill what Peter says. They want something that would uh, uh, touch their ears. They like it, this one. But cutting words, they don't want to listen. And if you try to repeat Acts chapter 1 to up to 8, the preaching of disciples were piercing, cutter, sharp words. And when these sharp and cutting words pierce their hearts, they said, what we shall do? Repent the chains rather than smooth and sweet. Yes, there is a place for sweetness of the words. Nice word, there is a placement. But if everything all, and we are not doing it well as the will and the truth of God, that is formalism. The enemy of God. And there is only one. If not God is not worship in a genuine spirit, then we worship the other God, which is the God of this world. Let's look at a closer look. The observation only in a lip service. Let me read. Look at in another direction. At those hundreds of people whose religion seems to consist a lot of talk and profession. 
They know the theory of the gospel with their heads, but they never get any farther. When you examine the inner lives, you find that they know nothing of practical godliness. They are neither truthful, nor loving, nor humble, nor honest, nor kind, nor gentle, nor giving, nor honorable. What shall we say to these people? They claim to be Christian, and yet, there is neither a substance nor fruit of their Christianity. There is one thing to be said. They are formal Christian. Their religion is only an empty form. That's a piercing words. We need to look at it carefully, my brothers and sisters. If we try to look at these illustrations I have on my screen, formalism is that the church is on a dangerous cliff. Sooner members will fall down. If you have understand this, this is because of formalism. Because genuine church membership, genuine relationship to the Lord, genuine worship, stay close in church, even the church is burned. But when formalism Everybody loves it. Where do they find worthless worship of God's people in the Old Testament? There are so many passages scattered in the Old Testament that portray God's people. Worship become worthless. We select five passages for these are unbelievable yet it happened. Isaiah chapter 1, Jeremiah 7, Ezekiel 8, Amos 5, and Malachi 1. I can find a lot. But let's not see. When worship become worthless. Worship as an abomination. Wow. This is strange. Worship should glorify, praise, honor. All we attribute to God. But listen. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's read. Hear the word of the Lord you rulers of Sodom. Huh? People of God? Their leaders are called rulers of Sodom. Remember what is Sodom and Gomorrah? Give ear teaching of our God. You of Gomorrah. What to me is multitude of sacrifices, says the Lord. I have enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of fat, as well as feed beasts. I do not delight the bloods of the bull or the lambs or the goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required you trampling my courts, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is abomination to me. Your new moon, your Sabbath, the calling of convocation. I cannot endure the iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons, your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. What a description. And that's why I will always caution my student. When you read the Bible, read it carefully. Because in this context will give us that God's people really exactly like Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet, what happened? The ritual in the sanctuary, the bloods of the bull, the lambs and the goats, the offerings, the incense, the ritual, the Sabbath, the whisper, the midweeks, the eway. And all other gatherings. God said, I hate them. In fact, they are abomination. Why? Because. They worship God. According to their concept and ideas. Rather than following what God says. In his word, which is the truth, which is the law, which is what Jesus way, the way to God. When I read Isaiah, I just simply recoil because it happens to God's people. 
And Jesus repeated it in his time. They have not learned after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. They returned to the old life of sin. And we are not different from them. God hates formalism as abomination. Come to worship God. Offering, incense, new moon, Sabbath meetings, prayers, appointed feasts, all these and other secret ceremonies were required by God, but now the Lord hates, turned into a burden. He got to weary, worse of it all, it was judged as an abomination to him. Can you? Why? People are doing them for the sake of accomplishing ceremonies, but not genuine, heartfelt act of worship. Live service, external piety. Yet people were feeling justified, satisfied, sanctified, for they have performed all the outward requirements of God, but their hearts and minds are not with God. Are we not doing it today? Look how you come to church. Are you going there to hear the word of the Lord or to watch the mistakes of others? Find the faults of others. The spirit of the Pharisee in the temple. This is dangerous. When you come to worship, be a blind caller. Focus on God rather than what you see around. This is a problem of formalism. We enjoy, fully dress, come to church, bring offering, bring tithes. We bring our body and yet our mind, our heart, we are not bringing to God. That's the problem. That's an abomination. Cutting words, piercing words. It's not mine. It is what God says. We need to learn the lessons from our ancestors. Only by learning lessons from our ancestors, we get wisdom and walk in the pathway of wisdom of righteousness. Let's go to formalism in Jeremiah's time. Formalism is a style, especially in religion, in which great attention is paid to the outward form of appearance rather than to the inner reality or significance of things. Formalism has been a perennial problem for God's people. In Jeremiah's day, the nation of Judah as a whole trusted in the outward forms of religion, such as the temple, believing that they were mere presence of these things, were guarantee of God's people. The personal close relationship to God did not matter. The life of moral holiness and ethical were just taken for granted. That's what happened in Jeremiah. And it happens today. You know, when I look, every Book in the Bible, I find typology in our time. From Genesis to the book of Jude, I find it typologically how God can make such wonderful understanding of what happened to his people in the end from Genesis 2 and converged because the entire Bible meets its fulfillment and end in the book of Revelation. So let's look at again in Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all of you Judah who enter the gates to worship the Lord, the saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Amend your ways, your doings, I will cause you to dwell this place. Do not trust these lying words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are this. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, who do shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other guards, 
to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place and in the land I give you your fathers forever and ever. This is sin of institutionalism. What's that? They keep on coming to the gates of God to worship Him. And they always say, okay, so long as this temple stands here, we will not be taken to Babylon no matter what we do. And God said, Amen. Repent. Change your ways. Change your doing. Execute judgment between man and his neighbor because the people of God oppressed the stranger, the fatherless, molested the widow, shed innocent blood inside the altar, the house of the Lord, and they walk and worship other gods in the altar, in the temple of the Lord. And God said, when you change this one, then I will cause you to dwell in this place. What a horrible picture. Is that happening in our church today? We might not be killing in literal limbs. We might not be oppressing the widow, the fatherless, and the innocent. But it's what is our thinking. Plagrant violations of God's law. In today's settings, so long as we keep the Sabbath, it is safe and okay to God. I've been pastor in Maguindanao. I heard this lemon of mine who was a soul winner and admire him for being a good soul winner. But my heart is really saddened when he say, so long as we keep the Sabbath, we are saved. Then I told, in my sermon, I told them, yes, why the Sabbath become so special? Because the Ten Commandments should be obeyed rather than single out the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Don't give tithes. That is stealing. Keep the Sabbath. Do not, offer, do not honor your parents. You're violating all. Because the violation of one is violation of all because they are interconnected, linked with one another. When you destroy one, you destroy all. This is what James says. I said, keep the Sabbath. Do not participate in the work of God in evangelism and reaching other people. That is institutionalism. And we have today. I'm not against the Sabbath. I love the Sabbath. Because it tells me that I'm a sinner, that I am a creature. That I am to worship the God who created me. The Sabbath helped me that God would make me holy because I'm a sinner. I am dirty. I'm not worthy. But His grace, because the Sabbath is a symbol of sanctification when we obey it and we know the Lord. Let me read that again. Behold, you trust in a lying words that cannot profit. You steal. What? God's people? You steal. You murder. You commit adultery. Swear falsely. Burn insults to Baal. Walk up the other gods. Whom you do not know. Then come and stand before me in this house. Which is called by my name. And say we are delivered to do all these abominations. I cannot imagine. What the people of God in the Old Testament have done inside the church. Inside their bad, in, outside their bad. But claim, perform the worship, the requirements of the Lord. Has this house which is called by my name become a den of thieves? In your eyes, behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast all your brethren, the whole prosperity, posterity of Ephraim, the ten tribes, the southern kingdom, the, uh, the Samaria. They were taken all captives in 721 BC to the Assyrian captivity. The same scene. Just imagine that. Formalism. 
has come to this house who is called by my name. When I was a young pastor, I witnessed a lot of problem in my district. During Sabbath school, leaders almost boxing. And I have a candidate for baptism, ex-governor, and two public school teachers and others. After lunch, the ex-governor and the said, Pastor, thank you very much. I did not know that this church is really this kind of people. We will not be baptized. And I got so mad throughout that week. Just imagine time of praying, intercession, calling God that these people will come to the truth. And yet, no self-control. They just quarreled because one borrowed money and did not. And during Sabbath school lesson, it was time to ask the payment. And almost there was a boxing. And the whole congregation stand up. Stood up in the benches, shouting and crying, and the people outside say, Oh, look what happened to the saints. They are fighting. We may not repeat the same activities, but the principle is the same. This is a plagiant violation of God's law. That's why I discussed the other, the previous episode we have. Know what is true. His word, that his law, his word, is truth. That Jesus is truth. Here, people who claim to have the truth, what they have are all lies. Look at again, still in Jeremiah. Therefore, do not pray for these people, God told to Jeremiah, nor leave your prayer on them or make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. You do not see what they do in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. Just imagine that. God told the prophet, Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Do not lift your hands in prayer. Make intercession for me. I will not hear. Why? Because the children gather wood and the father kindle a fire and the woman knead a dough and make cakes for the queen of heaven and they pour out the drink offerings to other God that they may provoke me to anger. Just imagine that. Who are our queens of heavens today? God have mercy on us. Let me continue. They do not provoke me to anger, says the Lord. They do not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces. They lost the sense of shameless, embarrassment, hard face. This is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice and I will be your God. And you shall be my people and walk all the ways I have commanded you. And it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ears. But follow the counsel and the dictates of their evil hearts. And they went backward and not forward. Just imagine that. Is that the spiritual condition of the church today? I think so. I think so. Many of us don't listen to the word. We prepare our own word rather than the counsel and the dictates of the truth that is in the Bible. They went backward instead of forward. Ellen White says that people of God have been welcome in the city, but yet they stay years and years on planet Earth because they are hard-headed. In fact, Ellen White says, half of the testimonies had not been obeyed, the people of God. That has had during her time, much more our time. There's a lot of question about the spirit of prophecy. Rather than obeying it, we find a kind of people, formerly seminical style, abomination inside the sanctuary. Oh. You know, really, my heart is broken. 
Because sometimes you say, oh, the people of God who keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign of God's people. It's the seal of God. It is so. Don't you know that the only people who receive the seal of the Sabbath as the seal of God's protection and sanctifying grace and knowledge of God are the remnants, the few faithful. But majority of the people did not. Listen, behold, the glory of God in Israel was there, like the vision I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, son of man, lift your eyes towards the north. So I lifted my, uh, my eyes towards the north, and there the north, all the altar gate was the image of jealousy in the entrance. Therefore, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they're doing? Great abomination that the house of Israel has committed here to make me go away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. It happened inside the temple of God, committing great abomination. First, the image of jealousy. And more. The abomination was done inside in the sanctuary. The temple, the place of worship, praise and honor and glory of God. And so he brought me to the door of the court of the temple. And I looked, there was a hole and then a wall. Then he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug onto the wall, there was a door and he said to me, go and see the wicked abomination which they are doing there. So I went in and then saw and there a sort of creeping thing, abominable beast and all idols of the house of Israel portrayed around the walls. What are we doing in church on Sabbath? We just come to be seen Fully dressed? I'm not against with that. When we come to church on Sabbath, there must be no abominations. Because this kind of worship, God hates it, is an abomination. Let's move. The elders and their idol, the women worship Egyptian God. And there stood before 70 men of elders in the house of Israel. In the midst stood Jasenia, the son of Sapan. Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud in the incense went up. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. And he said, turn again, and you will see greater abomination they are doing. So he brought me to the door and the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting, weeping for Tamos. Can you imagine? Elders in their own room, the dark room, they have their own idols. The great abominations. Women, I tell you, worse. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Turn again. You see greater abomination than this. So he brought me to the inner temple of the Lord's house. And there the door of the temple of the Lord. Between the porch and the altar. And about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord. And their faces towards the east. And they are worshipping the sun towards the east. And he said to me, have you seen this oh son of man? It is a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abomination which they commit here. For they have filled the land with violence and they have returned to provoke me to anger and they deposit the brands on their nose. Inside the sanctuary. That's why Jesus repeated that. If you read the Gospels. Inside the sanctuary. It's incredible. Just imagine. And if you understand this, this is the reason why there was a separation and sealing in chapter 9. Six years later, they were taken to Babylon. And there was a killing inside the sanctuary from youngest to the oldest, except those who are remnant who were not contaminated with this wickedness inside the sanctuary. 
Go to church. Think. Think. What are you doing? The church is God's temple for His praise, honor, and glory. Do all inside the church what give glory to God. If I were to read what Ellen White says, many worshipers of Sabbath today, they have an idols in their hearts. They are seen in the temple of God, but inside they have a file and file of their gods. This is formalism. The deadliest consequences of formalism. The spiritual condition, they are walking dead. Isaiah, Israel lost total discernment when the curse, when they call evil good, darkness light, better for sweet, sweeter, and uh, sweet better. When we lose discernment, we do things as if it is okay for me, it's okay for the Lord. That is not correct. Biblical understanding of the truth. In Jeremiah's time, Israel worshipped the bones of the kings, the princes, the prophets, the sun, the moon, all the hosts of heaven. In Ezekiel, Israel's sin, his rebellion, wickedness, abomination exceeded more than the nations around them. Just imagine that. The ten tribes were taken captive to Assyria, 2 Kings 17, 24 to 41. The two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were taken captive to Babylon for 70 years because the same sin, and God given them ample years to repent. They have not. They enjoy formalism. Because if you read this Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, he says, as the priests and the kings and the princes and the elders, so the people. When leadership is in a bad situation, we are casting a dark shadows to the rest. This is what happened in the two tribes. They landed Assyria and Babylon. Let's go to Amos. I hate, I despise your feast day. I do not savor your secret assembly. Do you offer me burnt offerings, your grand offerings? I will not accept them. I will not regard your fatten feast offerings. Take away the noise of your song. I will not hear the melody of your string instrument, but let justice run down like a water and righteousness like a stri mighty stream. Oh, I thought it was done. But the picture really is horrible. As a son honor his father in Malachi, and the servant is master. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord. You priest, you despise my name. In the book of Malachi, it's centered on those spiritual leaders. If you understand, those are for the priests. Who in charge in the sanctuary? Yet you say, in what we have despised your name? You offer defiled food, my altar. But say, in what way we defiled you? Say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer a blind sacrifice, it's not evil. What kind of priesthood? They know the quality. What are the offerings? The priest. So if you read Malachi, even the tithes, they stole it. But that is not, that's a mild language. The language of Malachi is you rob robbery rather than stealing. The deeper sin. And when you offer a lame, sick, it's not evil. Operate to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? 
nor I will accept an offering from your hands. From the risings of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered my name. A pure offering for my name shall be great among the nation, says the Lord. But you profane it. In that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, its fruit, its food is contemptible. You just imagine that? Those who does not know God have offered worship correctly. And these people who believe to claim to know the truth. That's why I discussed that. What is truth? What are the strands of the truth? What is the will and the truth? This is what happened about Sabbath keeping. Israel actually keep the Sabbath holy from Egypt when Moses and Joshua were still alive. After these two great leaders died, you will find they have a hard struggle in keeping the Sabbath holy until they landed in Babylon for captivity. Only the remnant keep it throughout their history as you look at these verses. But our favorite text is that, Ezekiel 20, verse 12 and 20. Oh, the Israel keep the Sabbath wrong. Ezekiel 20, correct interpretation and exegesis, verse 12, is a call to return at a true, genuine Sabbath keeping from a perspective of Exodus, from Exodus until the death of Joshua. Because the race of the verses of Ezekiel 20 is a violation of the Sabbath, of the sanctuary of the truth. But still, they come on the temple. Here is my illustration. 3D and the real. That is a simple illustration of formalism. Are you real? Or there is another unreal. Let's go to the New Testament. The Lord Jesus and his apostles had to unveil formalism New Testament times. The Lord speak on formalism of religion duties in his days. Religious devotions that only to be sent by men. For Jesus Christ, any prayer, I'm giving, fasting, any service to God, only to be sent by men, are forbidden. He declares, take heed that you do not know charitable deeds before men to be seen. Otherwise, you have no reward in heaven, Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before they, because they are hypocrites, they do in synagogue, in the street. They may have glory of men. Wow. When the Pharisee get $100 and put a sound trumpet. Wow. And people raise their heads. Who is doing it? Wow. To be seen in the synagogue, in the streets, and before men. You have not learned. Malachi was written after 70 years. They came back. They have not learned their lessons. That's why I put that as a secondary title. Lessons from the Old and New Testaments of formalism. When worship becomes worthless. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue. On the corners of the street, that they may be seen. As surely I say to you, they have the reward. But when you pray, go to your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret. And the father who sees you in secret, reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as they hidden do. For they think that they will be heard and many words. Fasting is important religious activity. But Jesus says, when you fast, become Theatrical and fancy, it is a plain, acted, religious rite. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like a hypocrite. Very sad in countenance, they disfigure their faces, and they may appear to men to be fasting, as surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, and do not appear to men to be fasting. But your Father, who is in reward, open it openly. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. I witness that. I'm not destroying wilderness. 
I've been assistant church pastor in Wildwest. And I was one of those who recommend to the fund. Why everybody say, oh, you are so weak. Oh, I'm fasting for three days. When you fast, keep quiet. Do not brag. Take a bath. Or you smell hell. Jesus talks the opposite. This is a formalism in the New Testament. Let's look at religious leaders. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes, to the disciples, the scribe and the Pharisee, sits in Moses. But do not do according to the works, but all their works, they do to be sent by men. And there was a perfect curses seven times. Woe to you, woe to you. Perfect curse. When we have formalism. Why live service? External righteousness. Just to be seen and perform routine religious rituals. Expert in a smoke screen. For Jesus charged them with lawlessness. Verse 28. Persecuting, killing, crucifying messengers of God. Even murder God's servant in the altar. And yet they worship God. Just imagine that. And that's the main reason Jesus hung on the cross. Religious outward appearance is little. What do you scribe and Pharisees? Today, how many really in church who has the spirit of the scribe and Pharisees? Who are plastics? Hypocrites? You know what is hypocrites in the time of Jesus? He's an actor of playing different rules. But today is a different. Hypocrites, you pay tithe of men and honest and cumin and have neglected the wither matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. You ought to have done without leaving others and then blind guide who strain out the gut and swallow the camel. That's incredible. You swallow something like an egg of a mosquito and yet you screen that but you swallow a camel. Hypocrites cleanse the outside of the cup and this and the inside are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind piracy. First cleanse the inside of the cup and this and the outside may be clean also. How many of us today, my brothers and sisters, it's a time of the end. This is the truth in the sanctuary, the present truth that we need. We stop formalism in church. Just to go there to be seen. Must. I have seen this in many houses. Whenever I see these images, I can always remember the Old Testament and the New Testament. People who engage in formalism should reel you before God. Men, you're useless. We want to be impressed. We want to be good looking to people in front of us. Our, our, our dignity, our honor, our all of this, we want to protect, but we are not protecting the God of heaven who has, we are responsible in the end, in the day of judgment. This is incredible. Result of formalism in Jesus' time. Jesus warned the religious leaders of a serious formalism done in his spiritual leaders in the nation. They rejected Jesus as the only hope of the nation. And they were so diehard in religious ritual. Israel lost the privilege as a, lost, as a chosen people of God. They were destroyed in their city and their temple in AD 70 by the Romans. They were scattered and persecuted for more than 1,000 years. Question, what about this spiritual Israel? Are they not repeating the same formalism? I'm just asking questions. This is the end time truth from the sanctuary. 
Question again. Are we not of the same nature and sinners like the Old and New Testament people of God? Are we not doing the same mistake, sins, wickedness, rebellion, faithlessness, and doing the same formalism, but in different forms and different practice? Jesus used the term hypocrites in which in their own time is a stage actors to be seen and win the approval. Jesus indicated several times to be seen just to show not reality, pretenders to the throne of God. In our time, hypocrite is someone who says one thing but does another. A person who is two-faced, who is inconsistent and puny. I don't care what people talk about me. I care what God says about me. Because human are all subjective. Very few are really objective. So when we come to God, let's be honest. Let's stop. Who is responsible for formalism? This is the most dangerous. Jesus declared the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eyes is good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Why? Personal. Because in the human eyes, it is really light. But God, when he evaluates it, it is darkness. Personal responsibility for failure to examine oneself. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places. This influences our thinking. But even if our gospel is built, according to Paul, it is built those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The enemy of God blinded human spiritual eyes to see. So we need to evaluate serious, seriously with our spiritual conditions. Perilous time. Notice in the last days, perilous times will come. Men, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to prayer, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of wood, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than God. All these unchristian characters are we can find manifested in church today. Conformity to the world custom. Convert the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. According to the angels that talk to Ellen White, these people, earth attracts them. It's richer, seems work to them. This is a dangerous. Pivoritism and discrimination is part of formalism. It's clear in James. Have you not discriminated among you and become judges of evil thoughts? You dishonor the poor. It's not the rich who are exploiting you and they are not the ones who are dragging you into the court. That's what happened. Avoid pivotism. That is part. No practical godliness. What good it is, my brother? And Caesar, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? No. Suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food, what does it proper, my brethren, if someone say he has faith but does not work? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one says to them, depart in peace and be warm and be filled. But you do not give them things which they needed for the body? What does it profit? Does also faith itself. It does not have works. It's dead. This is parallel to the ships of Matthew 25 where the people committed sin of omission against the disadvantaged, the destitute, the poor, the prisoner, the strangers and others. Our picture is so good. But is this picture the reality in the evaluation of the leader of God in heaven? Let's look at Toil and White. 
A mere formalism of Christianity is not the least value. It is destitute of saving power, having it no reformative energy. A religion which is confined to Sabbath worship emits no rays of light to others. Ellen White says, a form of Christianity. Sabbath worship emits no rays of light to others. Brethren, unless you educate yourself to respect the place of devotion, you will receive no blessing from God. You may worship Him in form, but there is no spiritual service. That's a hard language. The evil of formalism cannot be too strongly defected, but no words can properly set forth the deep blessedness of genuine worship. When human beings sing with the spirit and the understanding, the heavenly musician take up the strain and join the song of thanksgiving. How can the heart be in harmony with the words of sacred song? How can the heavenly choir join the music in the form only? Wow. Ellen White say, there is formalism in worship, there is formalism in music. Once you sang to entertain people in the leisure of God, I don't know whether it could be attributed as a song of praise. It's clear from Ellen White, even prayer. There are two kinds of prayer. Prayer in form and prayer in pain. The repetition of sit customary praises when the heart feels no need of God. In a formal prayer, we should be extremely careful in our prayer to speak the wants of the heart and to see only what we mean. And all the flowery words at our command are not equivalent to one holy desire. The most eloquent prayers are but repetitions if do not express the true sentiment of heart. Do you know how to pray? Prayer is not expression for sin. It has no virtue or merit in itself. All the flower words at our command is not. Idle words, if they do not express the true sentiment of the heart, but the prayer that comes from earnest heart when the simple ones, the soul, are expressed, and we would ask the earthly friend a favor, expecting it to be granted. This is the prayer of faith. God does not desire our ceremonial compliments. But the unspoken cry of the heart, broken, subdued with the sins of its sin, and utter weakness find its way to the Father of all mercy. So, many of us pray long prayers. There's nothing wrong when they are in a proper time, in a proper place. Ellen White says, Long, prosy talks and prayer are out of place anywhere, and especially in social meeting. And those are forward are ready to speak, allow the crowd out the testimony of the timid retiring. Those who are most superficial generally have the most to say. Mm. Their prayers are long, mechanical. They weary the angels and the people who listen to them. Our prayer should be short and right to the point. Let the long prayer, tiresome petition be left to the closet. If any such to offer, let the Spirit of God into your hearts and it will sweep away all dry formality. Worship, there is formalism. Music, there is formalism. Prayer, you weary the angels, not only the worshipers. The church is mixed with the wheat and tares. Here we see the church of Christ militant is not church triumphant. Today, the church is composed of wheat and tears. 
Not all who claim to be sons and daughters of God are in, in the truth. But the work of judgment has not been committed into our hands. It is lamentable truth that there are tears and counterfeit Christians in the church. But because of this will, look at them and feed defective character. If you do, you too will be rank among the tears. That's why I said, go to church. Blind color. Do not look at more fault. Praise and honor to God. Learn something. Something you get throughout the week that would reflect your mind and understand. We have a big problem today. I said in many of my episodes. What's the sermon of church? Oh, so nice. Oh, we enjoyed the sermon. What is it? I do not know. This formalism. I'm already old. Whenever I hear a sermon, I have to remember those words. I have a, my pen and my ball pen and write and look at it, what he says. I try to have a brilliant mind. What the pastor says, are they really in scripture? How to overcome formalism? Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which this dissipation, filled with spirit, speaking to one another, psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody on your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another in fear of God, rather than competing our own ego. What's the base house? The base have money. How is this? Yes, in this world, yes, that is acceptable, but not in God. If you bring this attitude in church, it's a dangerous thing. Genuine revival will result in reformation. Psalm 119 indicates the truest foundation of solid revival and reformation because. Formalism can only be arrested, corrected, when we have a genuine revival and reformation. Many have conducted revival, but the results are temporary. There was a flame and naturally dies out. Personal intention, revival first, not with others. In some repeatedly says, revive me in your word, repeated. Revive me in your way. Revive me in your righteousness. Revive me in your judgment. Revive me in your loving kindness. In some it is there are three R's. Revive, return, restore. But how can we revive? Because we are thinking we are already revived. How can we re See, return that we think we already return. How can we say we can be restored to God? We think we already restored. Last five years continue. Revival and reformation. Good. I was invited to a church. And there is a big tarpaulin. Revival and reformation. And one of the in charge told me, Pastor, you stop your sermon at 11.45. And already 11.30, I have not started because so many programs. So when I stood, I said, in our tarpaulin, it says revival and reformation. How can we revive in 15-minute sermon that I have prepared it for 10 hours? lip service. We need to return. Revive in the world. Revive in your way. Revive in your righteousness, in your judgment, in your loving kindness. Revive in obeying the law. This is true revival. True revival is not by a group. It's individual. When individuals have that, then as a group, then like a wildfire, we go forth 
and declare the gospel message of the character of Jesus Christ. When you come to church, look at this illustration. Do not come to church to worship empty and go home empty. Fill your vessel full. This is a crude illustration. But many of you go to the malls, go to the grocery. You bring your baskets. You bring your postcard and fill that when you go to market. But why you don't do it when you come to church? What was the sermon? Does it help you? I do not know. Was the sermon good? Yes, very excellent. We enjoy. What is it? I do not know. Empty. That's why we have no consumption for one week. If we prepare our food for a week when we go to market, we should do the same with our spiritual life. Because we don't live by bread alone, but the word of God. So every sermon and Sabbath should an added minu in our spiritual life in a week. Because the minister who prepared this message is for our own. So we are alive and revived with vital energy, renewing our energy, and our worship is genuine rather than faith. The new trends in the church worship today. I found this. God may be calling you, but probably not on your cell phone. Please turn up your phones during services. Our gadget becomes our idol. And we pretend it embodies calling rather than the one who created the heaven and earth. Sanctify this day. Smart it worship a distraction or an opportunity. I have. I look at it. I look at the text. But if you go selfie, selfie, selfies. This is the destruction of the church. We don't condemn them. Because everything, if it is good in church, you need to be careful to moderate. Even Ellen White says, many go to church well, they're dressed. Get attention to people and you cause the sins to sin. There are proper way. When we use our clothes, it's for the glory of God, not to get attention of the other worshipers. Do not be busy with your gadget. This is the worst idolatry. Because we listen to what we look, what is inside. It diverted us and the devil is working behind. And we do not understand that he is behind. This is our problem. Drink from the pure, solid spiritual food. Let the peace of God roll your hearts. To which also we are called in one body and be thankful. Let every word of Christ dwell in your richly in all wisdom. Teaching, admonishing one another in psalms in him. Spiritual song, singing with grace in your hearts. And do in the word or do in deed. Do all in the name of Jesus. Today, we are distracted with so many things. Even in church. Living and fed by the word. Read the text in the Bible. Refrain reading the text from your friend. It needs a disciplined mind. Paul said, the mind of Christ. Because the spirit that is fleshly and the spirit, spiritual life, are two opposite enemies. Those are back and forth, side by side, in the books of Romans chapter 8. If you live by the flesh, you will die. If you live by the spirit, you will live. Because the carnal mind does not 
please God. It is an enemy of God. Acceptable behavior in the church, Ellen White says. The song of praise and prayer, the word spoken of representative are God's appointed agencies to prepare a people for the church above. For that is lofty worship and there is inter nothing that defile from sacredness which attached to earthly sanctuary. Christian may learn how he should regard the place of the Lord which meets his people. That is inside the church. We miss this. In the Bible study, sharing, digging. But digging is hard. And we don't want to dig. We want to be fed. Our meetings should be made intensely interesting. I like that. You know what? Is our Sabbath school interesting? Is our lesson interesting? Is our EY interesting? All our gathering interesting? Change! Our meetings should be made intensely interesting. There should be pervaded with the atmosphere of heaven. Let there be no long, dry speeches, formal prayers, merely for the sake of occupying time. All should be ready to act their part. Promptness. And when their duty is done, the meeting should be closed. Thus, the interest will be kept to the last. This is the offering of God acceptable worship. His service should be made interesting, attractive, not to allow degenerate into a dry form. This is how to counteract formalism. Misuse and abuse of agape love. Gen reminds all Christians, do not love agape. The world or the things of the world. If anyone loves agape, the world, the agape love of the Father is not in him. It does not misuse, misuse God's love. Inside the church. Outside the church. He is, we have failure. God, God can understand our mistakes. But this, when we know the will of God, the truth. I want to end this sermon. My brothers and sisters. From the Old and New Testament. And to the present day, formalism is lurking. Not only lurking, but sometimes inside the church. And we do not know because we lost the spirit of discernment. It's a high time in the end time. Present truth that is cutting is needed. Sermons in evangelism is okay. But we need to revive sanctification and holiness. A life of practical godliness. A life of genuine worship. When we have a genuine worship, the Holy Spirit will come and we can finish God's work. Sad to say that many of us are preventing to finish God's work because we ourselves is a contributory to the delay and the problem of the church. We have so many problems in church. And this problem will not be solved until the coming of the Lord. Do not be disturbed. As I look at our church, there's nothing good in it. According to Revelation. Chapter 3. Verse 18 to 22. The Laodicean church. This is spiritual condition. is the condition of the remnant church. There's nothing good in the church. What is good in the church is that Jesus has a hope in his church. In spite of what he claims. He's knocking. Of the seven churches, this is the only church where Jesus is outside. He wants to be invited. Because it says, oh, I'm rich. I need nothing. That's the evaluation. Formalism. But Jesus' evaluation, the ledger of evaluation. Do you not know that you are wicked, wretched, 
poor, blind, and naked. Nothing. Opposite of what the church claim. We need to understand. We are a church of Bible prophecy. We have to do our God-given task to finish the work. How can we finish when formalism exceeds your existence and so excessive? Good in appearance. We'll discuss that in the next episode. We look at the leader of heaven and the leader of the evaluation of the Laodicean church. Because the portrayal of formalism in the Old and New Testament seems to be pervaded in this lustrous Darimnite church. My prayer, the words of the Bible is cutting and piercing. But this is the way God wants us so that we will be awakened in our comatose, in a spiritual condition, and we revive because the Holy Spirit is prompting, knocking us, chains. When we do this, we give the glory, the honor, the power, and the worship to the true God who created the heaven and the earth. This is my prayer.